Welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, my guest today um, is primarily known in these parts as the former mayor of New London, but uh, Daryl Justin Fenizio um, is an attorney. Most people probably know that. And um, we're going to talk more about legal stuff today. And um, just for people who only know him as the former mayor, um, Daryl, um, you know, starting, gosh, 20 years ago now. It's amazing to think <laughs> that it was 20 years ago, but yes. Yeah, um, was an intern with uh, then Attorney General White House in Rhode Island. Um, he was a criminal justice policy analyst in New York City uh, and was in New York City during 9-11, correct? correct. And uh, has been a licensed attorney in, in Connecticut and Rhode Island for the Twelve, last decade. Twelve years now, something. yeah. yeah. Uh, and is currently practicing law, again, uh, concentrating largely on, on criminal defense representation. That is very so, correct, and I was in court this morning, so I'm <laughs> glad I got out in time to uh, be here for the show. Yeah, I'm glad you did too. Uh, so we're going to talk primarily um, about the war on drugs and how it's affected um, criminal justice in, in the United States, actually over the last century. <laughs> Almost 50 years. Yeah, we're, we're coming up on a 50-year-long uh, policy, and I think that uh, it's more than about time to really assess, based on the numerics, as you would with any public policy, is this working? Uh, and uh, what were the motivations for it, the stated motivations and the unstated motivations, and what is the actual reality that we're dealing with every day if you're in the criminal justice system? And I think there's a lot here that we can certainly tease out and discuss. So, um, so we're talking, I'm guessing, you know, Nixon's war on drugs. A, a century, of course, ago, of course, nothing was illegal. Correct. Um, but things did escalate under Nixon, and the stated goal was? Reduce drug use and reduce violence and crime. Um, but uh, what we have learned in the decades after the Nixon administration collapsed uh, is that his domestic policy advisor, John Ehrlichman, uh, who went to jail uh, after Watergate, um, actually has come out or came out before he passed away and released documentation and made statements that demonstrated that the real motivation here in 1971 and 1972 was political. Uh, that specific groups were targeted uh, with the drug war and the, especially the classification of different drugs and why certain drugs were classified so highly uh, when there wasn't a lot of scientific evidence to show that, thinking specifically of cannabis, uh, a.k.a. Right. marijuana, um, was to target politically unpopular groups, the anti-war movement and African Americans and immigrant uh, Latinos, uh, all groups that were strongly opposed to Nixon uh, and groups that Nixon felt would be a hindrance to his re-election in 1972. Uh, and when you really analyze the first term of the Nixon administration, almost all the policies were geared towards re-election, uh, especially when it came to domestic affairs, so that Nixon could focus on his real interest, which was foreign policy and global affairs in the Soviet Union. So it was kind of a temporary, mostly political initiative uh, that, of course, once enacted, has been with us now 50 years. And many of the criticisms that we could make today were criticisms that were made at the very beginning of this policy. Uh, but once the policy was in place and once it was put in the criminal justice context, there has just been extreme political reluctance to really revisit the issue. Uh, but clearly, if the stated goals were reduce crime, reduce drug use, uh, reduce violence, it is a colossal failure. And in fact, uh, the drug policies of the United States and, and all of the 50 states are probably driving more crime and more drug use uh, than in fact doing anything to lessen it. Yeah, well, you know, you look back at prohibition and of alcohol, and there were some good stated reasons for prohibition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a lot of bad behavior caused by alcoholism, but it only took a decade for us to learn our lesson then, and the you know, the crime rate, the homicide rate, 
if I recall correctly, skyrocketed during that period. Correct. And you saw a lot of the exact same types of street violence and gang violence that you see now uh, associated with the illegal drug trade that was associated with the illegal alcohol trade. So it really is a repeat of prohibition. The only difference is that prohibition came about in an era where alcohol had been part of the national culture and society since the beginnings of, of European settlement in North America. So you were talking about disrupting something that ran very deep. So even though it was possible to get prohibition enacted, the effects of it were seen very quickly. The negative response to it was almost immediate. And of course, very quickly, the policy was changed. But drug use in the United States is relatively new. I mean, there have always been narcotics, drugs of different kinds out there somewhere. Um, and it seems like there's always new ones coming and going. But fundamentally, large-scale marijuana use and the advent and development of LSD and of other refined drugs really didn't take hold in the United States until the 1960s. So it wasn't like uh, you were prohibiting something that right. was being used by a broad percentage right. of the population that might have immediately reacted negatively to such a prohibition. M drug prohibition was always seen as targeting a small group, and especially those uh, people over there, those urban minorities, those people that most of the people, particularly in the white American majority, were taught to fear. Uh, right. So that dynamic played in a lot. And we're seeing that now, finally, after almost 50 years, crack, because obviously the opioid crisis has struck right. beyond the cities, struck beyond minority sure. communities, and is really ravishing uh, rural, poor, white populations all across the country has become a complete epidemic. And that's a tragedy and a horrible thing, uh, but at the same time, it provides some opportunity to break some of the old racial and political divisions that have clouded a real honest discussion of this policy. And, and you'd think that we'd have learned something. Oh, I was 18 in the late uh, 60s, uh, and we definitely felt under uh, the Nixon administration that our generation, uh, you know, that the administration was at war with our generation. You know, we were the anti-Vietnam War people. And uh, it's ironic to me now that so many people my age are, some are in the right place, but some are just kind of paying the generational warfare down, forward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there is an old Latin saying that comes from the days of the Roman Republic, uh, it, you know, so we're talking BC era here, <laughs> uh, that said, o tempora o mores, which translates to, o the times, o the morals. Modern context translation would be, oh, the kids these days. Um, you know, so it seems like every generation will look back and say, oh, the kids these days, or what are these, these kids are good for nothing. So I, I think some of that is just natural, and as people age, uh, that occurs. Uh, but I think that it is undeniable, just from what is in the public record, that this is not a uh, supposition on your part or on young people's part that the Nixon administration was at war with you they clearly were. Um, they wanted to suppress the youth vote. They wanted to mm. suppress the anti-war movement. And they really described that movement as traitorous. I mean, they saw this as the country is at war, that these people are undermining America in the middle of a war effort. Uh, and that is what led to the plumbers uh, after the Ellsberg right. release. So this is what led to a lot of the things that developed into Watergate and what developed into the drug war was this very fervent belief that those people that were opposed to the administration weren't just political enemies, they were traitorous enemies of the country. And now we're seeing some of that rhetoric creep back in, in the Trump administration, yeah. and it's almost a throwback to that same kind of far-right philosophy that anyone who disagrees with me is, is now a, a, a traitor. So we, I, I think it's, pretty clear that the stated uh, goal of the war on drugs has failed. Drugs are more plentiful, more used, cheaper, probably maybe more potent, but no safer for the consumer than ever. Um, but the unstated uh, goals, um, there's been success, 
they they've succeeded sure. at that and, at, at, at the disenfranchised. Sure, community. and let's so let's let's talk about we'll, that. We'll talk about that. I want to get into that, but before we do, just so that we're not speaking in generalities without some actual evidence behind what we're saying, when when you say that if the stated purpose of the drug war is to reduce crime, uh, to reduce violence, and to reduce drug use. Here are some numbers for people. Now, this is from an editorial I published in the New London Day uh, on February 21st, 2016. So we're coming up in two years, and we yeah. were discussing before the show, I could probably dust this <laughs> off in 10 more years, and it'll be just as true. Uh, but here are some numbers. And this is according to the United States Department of Justice. So this is not a made-up statistic. These are the official government uh, uh, records. We arrest someone in the United States for drug-related offenses every 19 seconds. So every 19 yeah. seconds there is a drug arrest in the United States, averaging over 1.6 million arrests per year. Nearly one in 100 Americans, 1% 1 of our population, our entire national population, wow. is incarcerated right now. One in 10 have been arrested at some point in their lives. Of those who are incarcerated, 70% Almost three quarters of all incarcerated offenders in, in prison in the United States are there because of offenses related to substance abuse in some way. And we, the United States, are only 5% of the global population, yet we have 25% of the world's prisoners. So we have incar incarcerated, arrested more people than we could ever, ever hope to do. And what's the cost? Well, uh, from 1970 to 2010, according to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, drug use has remained constant or gone up slightly. So use has been unaffected. People use drugs just as much, no matter how much we arrest people or how much we incarcerate people. Yeah, I think people. addiction rates remain pretty stable. Pretty steady and stable all throughout. And the last number here is how much have we spent we increased from spending under one billion in 1971 per year to spending over 20 billion in 2010, a total expenditure in that time frame of 1.5 trillion dollars. There is no more program apart from some of our large military programs like our entire sub-production contracts all put together that can even rival that level of government spending on any federal government program. So taxpayer watch groups should really be looking at this. We have spent more money on this than anything. We incarcerate more people than anyone. And drug use has only stayed the same or gone up. And violence, of course, associated with the trade has escalated as well. Last number I'll put out there is from the Centers for Disease Control. Again, primary source government statistics mm. kept year to year said that in 2013, there were 11,208 gun-related homicides in the United States. Over three quarters of these were centered in urban areas and are often associated with young people involved in the drug trade. So we have some of the most violent streets anywhere in the world uh, for a democratic society, for a modern society. We have an unparalleled level of gun violence and three quarters of it is in the drug trade. And well, and, and part of the issue is you're, you're a lawyer and I'm sure people don't come to you to settle their turf wars no. in the court of law. No, uh, this is something that will take place and always has in the street and will continue until we adopt a different policy. But you asked about, well, what are the unstated purposes here? Well, if the Nixon administration's design was to politically suppress African Americans, Latinos, urban voters, young voters. It succeeded because as well, another statistic is that three quarters of the people incarcerated in the United States are minority. So if you look at the history of our country, we went from a period where we had institutional chattel slavery, where people were property. That was abolished but quickly replaced with Jim Crow laws, segregation laws, laws that prohibited people from being able to vote, poll taxes, literacy tests, you name it. Uh, and then as that started to wane in the 50s and 60s, 1964 we get the Civil Rights Act, 1965 the Voting Rights Act, 1967 the first African American Justice of the Supreme Court, 
1971, the drug war. And now we are segregating and incarcerating as many minorities as we ever have been, except rather than doing it on the flat basis of race, where race is the clearly stated reason for the segregation or the incarceration or the discrimination, it's now being put under the rubric of crime. And we say, well, we're not just incarcerating African Americans, we're incarcerating criminals. But what they don't tell you is that all of the law enforcement targeting and all of the enforcement and all of the drug raids and all of the stop checks are done consistently in minority communities and urban communities and the wealthier white communities where just as many drugs are being used are not being targeted. And this is also nothing new. We can again look to prohibition for that, where yeah. the Kennedys had their exclusive bottles of champagne in the basement. No right. wealthy white family in Manhattan was without their good booze, uh, but the minorities and the immigrants in Chicago and elsewhere were the ones caught in the crossfire and arrested with regularity. And it's the same thing all over oh. again. Except this time it's been going on for five times as long. Five times as long and with a lot more uh, veracity and with a lot of far-ranging implications that I think many people don't even consider. Like, what happens when you go into a community and incarcerate all the men so that young children don't have fathers? Yeah. What happens when communities mm. become so plagued by violence and so neglected that the schools start to deteriorate, that the home values deteriorate? Um, when people get a drug arrest and they have a drug conviction on their record, they no longer get access to loans, mortgages, student loans, mm -hmm. you name it. So where is their economic availability to be mobile? Um, they can't get jobs because they have felonies. And, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And we, we wind up creating a worse situation than we would have if drugs were not criminalized and we were dealing with it more as a public health matter as opposed to a criminal matter. I think one of the... Uh people who was on the show many years ago from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition estimated that 75 to 80 percent of our drug problem is related to prohibition and 15 to 20 percent on the problems that come with abuse and addiction directly. I, I, would n I don't know that statistic specifically, but I would not be surprised by it in the least. And, and when you see people like I do in the criminal courts who are involved in drugs, you're often dealing with people who are involved in drugs because it's the only economic way out for them. Uh, they did not go to a good school. Uh, they may or may not have graduated. They have no family structure. They mm. live in very tough economic conditions. And their prospects are maybe, maybe, maybe a job that makes minimum wage where they can't possibly pay their bills or a quick short drug sale where they can survive. So, you know, I'm not saying that all of these people who are engaged in criminal activity should be excused of their criminal activity. I'm also not saying, and I don't think any of us would say, that right. drugs are good or that people should use them or anything right. like that. But if you just look at it as, is this policy working? It is not. And how many of the other problems associated with the drug war, like violence, criminality, yeah. breaking and enterings, all of these kinds of things, how much of that would be reduced if rather than putting people through the criminal justice system, we were putting them through a public health system instead. Oh, well, and, and the, I know I've told you this, but the way I got interested in this issue, some people might assume that it's because I'm of that generation, so I must love drugs. <laughs> but really, I, I, I became interested when I worked for Head Start. I was working with three and four-year-olds in New London and many of them had incarcerated parents. And the last year I, I worked for Head Start, it was 2006, 2007, um, four of my 12 students had incarcerated parents. And in the case of three of them, both parents were incarcerated. So they were living with other relatives, uh, supposedly under the supervision of DCF, but not very good supervision. One of the children actually lost, her, the kid lost her health insurance through a mistake. Um, 
the, kid, the families live in dangerous neighborhoods, so the children never got a chance to play outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really costly to fix that. It's, it's, it's a lot, and I think that just ending the drug war itself would only really be a good start in terms of true restorative justice that needs to take place in a lot of these communities that have been completely devastated. Uh, and some people would say, well, if you're going to have universal health care, if you're going to have good quality universal education, there's a cost associated with that. Uh, to that, I would say two things. The first is that the super wealthy in this country, where 82% of all new wealth has gone to the upper 1%, and they just got a massive tax cut, and they're paying far less than they used to pay oh. in this country, and far yeah. less than they pay in any other country, I think first and foremost, the billionaires can pay their fair share, and they're currently not. But even to the average person, even to the average taxpayer, I would say, look, we are spending money now. We have spent $1.5 trillion more now, because these numbers are a yeah. little old, more than $1.5 trillion on the drug war, and it's not working. So if we could spend a fraction of that on health services and on educational right. services, which would work, that we know it works, as opposed to something that we can clearly see is, is not working. So it's really a choice that we're making. It's not like we're spending here or not, you know, or, or right. not. We're going to spend somewhere. The question is, where is it going to actually make a difference? Yeah, and, and a positive difference at that. I was going to ask you uh, how you would view, I know there's some talk of you know, reparations should our policies change. Mm -hmm. um, what form do you think might be useful to use that money for to help restore communities? Sure. Well, I think that that phrase gets twisted and a lot of people don't understand what it may or may not imply. Um, I think that there are certain circumstances where straight line reparations can be made. Uh, when you can see a university, I think it was Georgetown, that had owned slaves. And this Jesuit university sold slaves in order to generate wealth for their institution. Now that wealth is still there. That institution is right. very wealthy. They, they have this money still and they've profited off of the money they got from these slave sales. And there are also descendants of those exact slaves living in this country who can prove, I am a descendant of that slave you wow. sold, and you still have all the money. I'm still here. You're still here. Those are situations where actual direct line reparations may be made through some sort of civil process uh, or settlement where the university might pay those descendants oh some direct compensation. So there are reparations that, that can actually be done in a direct sense. But when I think of reparations and I think of restorative justice, I think more of prioritizing and changing from spending on prisons, spending on drug enforcement, to spending on schools, spending on health care, spending mm. on programs that help prisoners reintegrate into society. Uh, I think there's a tremendous misconception particularly among uh, more affluent white Americans who come from kind of the socioeconomic background that I come from. Um, growing up in Wesley, Rhode Island, going to a good school, living in a mostly white community through my mm -hmm. formative years, you approach things with a very different mindset. And I think that there is a, an assumption on a lot of people's part that everybody in jail is just the worst of the worst. And I think when you actually get into the criminal justice system and you get into the prisons, you see that most people in there are there because of circumstance and are there in large part because of discriminatory policies. And that if given the chance, a genuine chance, to make their lives better, to be productive members of society, they would do that and they would take that opportunity. The problem is those opportunities are simply not there. You get out of jail, you're just left on the street, and it's up to you, good luck. And what, do you, and what do you do, you know? So I think that any type of programming that would help us mm. transition and help the people that have been most affected by these failed policies transition into, the, into a new economy uh, would be appropriate forms of restorative justice. Now you had talked about the racial disparities in enforcement and I know you've, 
I think, wrote something about DUI checks. I uh, did. Um, it's a good example of how there can be disparities in enforcement, and it, and it takes it out of the drug context. Because I think when you think about drugs, you know, people have a hard time seeing how this plays out. But here's a good example on DUIs. Uh, DUI stop checks are sobriety checkpoints. When every single person or every fourth person driving a car through that check has to be stopped, and if they detect an odor of alcohol or smell marijuana or whatever the case may be, you could get arrested for a DUI. Well, in the city of New London, uh, they used to do these a lot. When I became mayor, that stopped uh, because I criticized where they were being done. Now, I'm no longer the mayor, and <laughs> we're doing them again. And it was just recently announced where they would be. And it was like the usual suspects. Well, we're going to go to Coleman Street. We're going to go to South Water Street after the bars close. I mean, you know, this kind of stuff that is going to pick up the exact same people, and they are overwhelmingly in poorer neighborhoods, and they will probably overwhelmingly be minorities that get picked up in these stop checks. So my suggestion was a little different. Why don't we go to Plant Street in New London? Now, for those watching who aren't from New London, you may not know these reference points, but... Plant Street cuts the south end of New London right. off from the rest of New London. There are three access points to the south end, Pequot Avenue, Montauk Avenue, and Ocean Avenue. They all intersect Plant Street. So how about on Friday afternoon, say at about 3 o'clock, we set up stop checks on Plant Street on Pequot, Montauk, and Ocean. And we stop every single car until 8 o'clock that night on a Friday going to our nice waterfront homes. We stop every SUV, BMW, Mercedes, we stop them all. We stop the lawyers, the bankers, the brokers, everybody. And we see how many of them have had a cocktail or two at a Friday happy hour and are driving home. So I think you would see a lot of people arrested, a lot of people who would never expect to be arrested in a million years because their cars would never be pulled over in routine law enforcement stops. And that's the prime example. So the issue becomes not who's breaking the law. We know everybody's breaking the law. But if we're only enforcing it in a particular area at a particular time, you are not going to catch everybody or have a fair shot at catching everybody. You're only going to get the usual suspects who usually tend to be minorities, poor people, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you can take that example on DUIs and extrapolate it out to drugs. You know, in, in wealthy communities in this country, there is plenty of drugs being done, and everyone knows that. But those are not the homes that get no-knock uh, early morning right warrants, those aren't the places that get flash banged, those aren't the places that have cops routinely using pretextual reasons right. to question people and the list And from you know, the point of view of my experience, they're not the families where the kids are living with grandma or aunt and uncle because the parents are both in jail right. when they're, the kids are two years old. Correct. Or there isn't one person living in a house of six people who may have a criminal record and therefore allows the police to violate on probation anybody else in there that might have a probation charge because they're associating with a known drug user and so on and so forth. So I mean, when you really get into the weeds of it, you know, once people are kind of in the system, it's very easy to keep them in the system and to charge them with new crimes based on very small technical violations that they almost can't help uh, uh, but commit because of the very nature of, of where they live. Um, but you can also see this play out a little bit on the other side of it, too, in sentencing. And one of the real prime examples to demonstrate that was the penalties associated with different types of drugs. So for many years, the prime example, and it still is, is the difference between powdered cocaine and crack cocaine. There is no difference whatsoever in what these drugs are doing to you. They're terrible drugs. You shouldn't do them. Yeah, once you start refining the coca leaves, right, you're right, in the right. Weeds. Once you're once you're once you're refining cocaine of any variety, you're not doing well. Um, but powdered cocaine was traditionally used by wealthier white uh, defendants on average. Crack cocaine was the drug of choice, particularly in the '80s, of urban poor African Americans. So we got a rash during the Reagan era of laws that increased the penalties for crack possession 
but not powdered cocaine. No, actually, I think in the 80s, powdered cocaine was sort of not even very stigmatized in its use because during the Reagan years, the whole idea was, you know, they kind of glorified these, you know, Wall Street types who worked 20 hours a day. Right. And I, I think that's the, that, that is the point, actually, is yeah. that they didn't increase the penalties on powder cocaine. They did increase the penalties on crack cocaine because crack cocaine was associated with urban, urban minorities, particularly African Americans. But there's no real other reason for it. And it didn't do anything either, except incarcerate more minorities. And then, of course, in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, we got laws at different state levels like three strikes, you're out, and so on and so forth where people got one, two, three drug offenses. The last one might have even been a minor offense, might have been just a marijuana offense, a small amount of marijuana, and people are getting life, life imprisonment. Um, so there's some real obscene edges to this that I think show that there are fundamental flaws that run throughout the whole, whole policy. And that really points back to the um, initial unstated desire uh, with the war on drugs to uh, disenfranchise people of color, for example, and sure. poor people. And I think that there's a subconscious strain of that that runs through a lot of white America. Uh, I think a lot of people who grow up the way I did, you know, I grew up in Wesley, Rhode Island. Everything was nice. It was, you know, nice town. I grew town. up in Philadelphia, but, but I have to tell you, I, it, and I don't think there was a person of color in my elementary school because my immediate neighborhood was, was white neighborhood was, was very white my high school was very yeah. different but in the younger grades when we had neighborhood schools there was de facto yeah. segregation there and and what I saw growing up was this sense that if you lived in a community like mine and you grew up in a stable family environment the only thing you knew about urban minorities was what little you saw through TV and you saw, you know, the advent of like gangster rap in the early 90s and the news commentators, oh my God, you know, what is this? We've got this real problem, you know, and these people are doing all these drugs and stuff. And you get this impression like, oh my God, there's a real problem over there in that, that community when in fact there were probably just as many drugs being done on my street growing up, but I never even knew about it because you weren't kind of taught to think that way. We weren't really taught to think that drugs in and of themselves were the problem because they were everywhere. Right. It was those urban people over there who look different than me, who act different than me. You know, they're so violent, there's some problem there. And you see that even now with, with, with Donald Trump. I mean, uh, to, the, to, the, to the nth degree. He will say, my God, it's an American carnage going on. Look at Chicago, look at all this violence, look mm -hmm. at all these shootings, because it's minorities doing it. And it feeds into that subconscious white fear of this other and this dangerous minority. But when it comes time to confront Nazi marchers, he says, well, there are very fine people out there. Or when a, a white man shoots 500 people at a concert in Las Vegas, well, there's a mental illness issue here. But when it comes to urban minorities and drugs, it's, oh my God, this is, you know, be, be afraid, be very afraid, and we need to get tough again. Uh, well, and double well, down on the drug war uh, one more time. Well, well, even in a more general way, I think in Connecticut, you know, we have a, a huge wealth gap here, and um, the cities are kind of looked down on. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, you can look even in our own county. Um, the New London Day is based in New London, and obviously if somebody gets stabbed or somebody gets shot, that's going to be a headline. Right. And those are the headlines that come out of New London where there are minorities to surrounding communities that are overwhelmingly white. Yeah. And when you're sitting in Ledgerd or Montville or, or Voluntown and you read about, oh my God, these, these New London people with their guns and their, their stabbings and the whatever, you get a mental impression that I think is not really representative of the people that live in Absolutely. the city. And I live now on Mountain Avenue in New London, which is in the heart of one yeah. of the tougher neighborhoods in the city, quote unquote. And yet I can walk right down my street. And can I tell you, yeah, that house over there, there's drug activity in there and it got raided last month. Sure. Followed by four houses of people who are holding down three jobs to pay their mortgage. 
followed by a woman who's, I can think right now down my street, a 96-year-old woman living in her house she's been in since 1940. I can think of immigrants who live near me who work round the clock, it seems like, just to try to make ends meet. People in rentals next door to me who each person in the apartment has two jobs just to try to pay their rent. I mean, 90% of the people in my neighborhood, which is quote unquote the tough neighborhood, are law-abiding, hard-working people. But are they at least 50% minority? Yes. Are they in a lower income bracket? Yes. And do we have drug dealers and people on our street doing improper things? Yes. But that does not tell our entire story. And I think if more people in the surrounding environs really knew how many people in the cities obey the law, work hard, and are trying like crazy to, to, to do the right thing, they would think differently of it. Well, I think part of it, I, I lived in Pleasure Beach in Waterford for 15 years before I moved to New London. And you know what? A block that way was the crack house. Mm -hmm. And it may not, and there were some other kind of odd things that had a hostage situation. And mm -hmm. They did not necessarily make the front page news. And so when I moved to New London, we rode bikes a lot. We would always have our bikes stolen when we lived in Waterford. We really didn't in New London. So it just seemed odd to me that on one hand, the crime seems to be magnified in New London, but it, bad things that happen in other places seem to be suppressed as bad, well. Bad, bad things happen everywhere, um, but I think that a lot of people have fed into the rhetoric about the cities and about minorities and that subconscious fear has been amplified because when I was mayor I remember uh, having some numbers on the Crystal Avenue high-rises um, which are now in the process of being right. demolished and people have read all about that but not even touching on those issues just speaking on the issue of the people that live oh. there and I think I had it was like 350 some adults and 330 some had full-time jobs. So you were talking Sometimes about maybe two, ma maybe two or three part-time jobs put together, but they were working. And it was to the tune of like 80, 90 percent on any given day that you ran right. the numbers, people that were working and working hard. But when I would go on conservative talk radio, which I still do, I was on this last Sunday, you know, and I'd talk to the callers and I'd talk to the hosts and I would ask the question, You've got, let's call it 350 people yeah. in that high rise. How many do you think have jobs, full-time jobs? They would say 10, 15, oh my gosh. 25. How many do you think are on welfare? How many do you think are just on the dole sucking money? Oh, 350 of them, all of them, you know. Oh. So there's this sense there is. that everybody in New London is, is criminal, that all the minorities in New London are all bad people, that you know, they're all on the, on the dole, they're all on welfare, they're all blah, 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 blah. And it's absolutely not true. Everyone's working their ever-loving tail off uh, uh, Yeah, that's absolutely true. When you know, the application process for Head Start, you look at people's pay stubs because you have to be very poor to qualify by means of your, your, your income. And I don't know how things were back in the 80s, but certainly uh, after welfare reform under Bill Clinton, uh, every parent was employed. The only families I saw where the parents were not employed and often multiple, having multiple crappy jobs was um, if they had a child with such severe special needs that right. they had to be a full-time right. caregiver or where, if it was a retired grandparent raising the children. Right. Everyone else had a job, right. whether they were undocumented or documented, whether they were born here, what, they all worked. Right. They, but they still were poverty level. Right. So yeah, that... Um, so it, it's, 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 it's very true, and I think that that disconnect helps feed into the constant maintenance of the drug war because as long as particularly people in white communities see the drug war as keeping those threatening dangerous urban minorities away from me keeping my right. kids safe from them then the war will continue 
and it will not work, it will never work. Um, but hopefully we can bridge that gap with education to, so that people realize that no, the drugs are being done on both sides, the overdoses are on both sides, the deaths are on both sides, we're all wasting our money on this, and everybody on both sides really wants to, to move beyond it. But I think there's one other thing uh, that we can discuss at least about how the drug war has affected criminal justice Absolutely. beyond just the drug war context uh, itself. Yeah, I, in fact, that was next on my list. So oh. yes, uh, so how has policing changed uh, over the last 50 years? Well, I think that is really the thing that gets missed when people talk about the drug war, is that in the last 40 years or so, cases have come to the Supreme Court about police powers. When can the police stop you? When can they search you? When can they seize your items? When do they need a warrant? When are there exceptions to the warrant requirements? And so on and so forth. Most of these cases have been from the drug war. They're about a drug dealer being caught with drugs. And the Supreme Court has routinely, under the Rehnquist Court, the, well, the Burger Court, the Rehnquist Court, and, and now the Roberts Court, sided with law enforcement. And law enforcement's powers on the street have grown exponentially. And deference to law enforcement has grown exponentially. And I think what people miss in that is that those powers can now be applied in cases beyond the drug war. So I have a lot of libertarian friends who are very skeptical of the government and don't like what the NSA is doing, tapping everyone's phones and so on and so forth. Yet they're fervent defenders of uh, police and the drug war and everything else, and I try to tell them, look, a police officer right now has the right on the street to shoot you and kill you as long as they feel fear. That is a criminal axiom that has grown out of the drug war and grown out of some of the subconscious racism within the drug war. And when you hear about Black Lives Matter and you see uh, uh, people on video being gunned down by law enforcement. That is a direct result of this case law and this authority and this latitude that's mm. been given to police that wouldn't have happened were it not for the drug war. So there are many, many examples, and we could go on and on and yeah. on about this, but the fundamental principle is that police now have a lot more power, the constitutional protections that every citizen has in any case, not just a drug case, in any case, have been significantly lessened because of case law that has come out of the drug war and drug, drug cases. So the implications to this for civil rights, for the Constitution, for civil liberties are profound. You think the libertarians would be? But oh. it's in the context of drugs. And as yeah. long as the person being shot and killed is black, and as long as the person being shot and killed may have had anything to do with drugs, there is a tendency, particularly in the white majority, to write it off or, or not to see it for the broader problem that it really should be seen. I mean, it is a problem in and of itself for the yeah. African American community and for all of us because if that's happening to anyone in this country, it should upset everyone in this country. But people should see even beyond that what this means for law enforcement because if they can do that today, in a drug case, why can't they do it tomorrow in some other case? And then where does it, where does it really end? And we have seen a continued enhanced militarization of law enforcement. In, in a literal way, I mean, we're seeing military, military style, equipment right. being handed off to police departments. Yep. More and more surplus military equipment, equipment that is intended for warfare uh, in a combat zone is now being routinely deployed on American streets. And uh, the Trump administration with Attorney General Sessions wants to increase that and, and make it easier uh, for local law enforcement uh, uh, to continue their militarization. Uh, where it really struck me was in Ferguson. Uh, when Ferguson, Missouri's protests took place, uh, I remembered watching the protests and to a great extent the protests appeared, at least early on, completely peaceful. This was a nonviolent uprising that was met by armored personnel carriers and heavily, heavily 
armored law enforcement. And the last time I remember turning on my TV and seeing armored personnel carriers being brought out against overwhelmingly African American mm. peaceful protesters was right before the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Mm. And I literally thought to myself, what has happened in this country that I'm seeing something on an American television set from an American city that the only parallel I can think of <laughs> is apartheid South Africa. Something has gone off the rails here. And, and I hope that more people are starting to recognize that. And I think it has kind of gone beyond the drug war. I mean, we saw something similar in North Dakota with the you know, water protectors and the, their protests that were met with armored, militarized, uh, law enforcement. Well, it, it, if there is a group in the United States that can claim to have borne the greatest brunt of our discrimination and or our imperial uh, ambitions, it is the Native American population. Um, so in that respect, that discrimination has been going on a lot longer. Yeah. Uh, we can go back to the 1600s and the massacre at Mystic right here in New London County to know right that we will bring armed force against native peoples. Uh, so that remains unchanged and it's a tragedy in and of itself. Uh, but certainly some of that militarization is enhanced by the fact that the drug war has allowed Absolutely. overall militarization. So we only have a few more minutes. So what can people do? What can be done to rectify this? I, I think that that is obviously the, the million, well, excuse me, not million, $1.5 <laughs> trillion dollar question. Um, I think that people need to be more politically active in general in this country. Um, over half of the eligible voters in this country uh, do not vote. Uh, and even those that vote uh, do not always vote. Uh, so voter turnout is abysmally low and, and general political participation is even lower than that. Um, I can't overstate to anybody listening, how much of an impact even one person can have who wants to be truly active in the system. I've been involved in politics now for 26 years. My first full-fledged campaign was in 1992, and I've been at it ever since, almost every year, running for something or running somebody's campaign or being involved in some debate or being in court, that you show up at these campaign headquarters, even for congressional candidates, there are four people in the room. You right. show up at a city council meeting in your hometown for a key issue. There might be 10 people, 20 people, tops. So pretty much anywhere in this country, you show up with 50 people, you are going to have a massive impact. And if you get people to vote and voter turnout went up even 10%, you'd see right. dramatically different results, especially considering that that half of the population that doesn't vote and the population that doesn't get as active in politics is usually overwhelmingly poorer, minority, et cetera. So if more people participated at any level, I think you'll see change. But if people continue to not participate, then you are going to cede your power to those few people who do. And one, I've been told I have one minute, but I just wanted to ask you quickly, so if someone has stopped, uh, caught up in one of these ra random stops, what should they do? Well, first and foremost, say nothing and sign nothing. Um, I think a lot of cases that I've seen, especially in my own criminal defense practice, the individual client, the individual criminal defendant will do themselves in by saying things or by signing things, agreeing to searches and so on and so forth, that I essentially admit their guilt. Um, so remember, you have a constitutional right to remain silent, and you should use that right. <laughs> Even the President of the United States apparently is about to invoke that right. So if it's good enough for Mr. Trump, it's good enough for you. Well, thank you, Daryl. Uh, we'll have to do a repeat at some point, maybe in a year. Maybe Happy there to be back. Some we'll, things might We'll change. dust off the same editorial, and I bet you it'll probably be the same argument. Hopefully we'll have taken some baby steps. Well, Let's thank, hope. Let's hope. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Glad we'll to see be you here. around town.